I'm Simon. You may be curious about the title of this presentation, Acts, Geography and Governors. Well, consider this prediction that Jesus shared with his disciples. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me. So as Jesus' followers preach the gospel through the provinces of the empire, their message will get them into trouble. But that will give them the opportunity to preach to those in charge. And the book of Acts describes how that happened. It's a narrative of the preaching journeys of the Apostle Paul, written by his travelling companion Luke. So in Acts, there is geography, quite a lot of it. Here's a map of one of Paul's journeys. He and his companions preach in towns and cities in modern-day Turkey and Greece, and finally they get to Rome. And in Acts, there are governors, quite a lot of them too. And when the gospel is preached, there is often local dissent, sometimes violent, and the local rulers have to get involved and Paul gets hauled before them to explain himself. Now you may say, well, so what? Why should I, I, should, why should I be interested in geography and governors? Well, Paul answers that question by what he says at one of his trials. Two-thirds of the way through Acts, Paul is arrested and uh, taken under Roman escort to be tried. And by the end of the book, he reaches Rome, the capital of the empire. But to start with, he doesn't get very far, just to the coast Caesarea, where he awaits trial. He's in prison for two years. And after a series of delays, he, he finally gets to speak to Agrippa, who is the the great-grandson of Herod the Great. And now in his speech to Agrippa, he sets out the reasons why we should care about this idea of geography and governors. It's in chapter 26. Towards the end of his speech, Paul says, And King Agrippa knows about these things. I speak boldly, for I am sure that these events are all familiar to him, for they were not done in a corner not done in a corner. He's saying these events, and by that he means Jesus' death and resurrection and the early preaching of the gospel, these events weren't done in private or secret. Everyone would be aware of them. They're part of the historical record. And Paul's point is that there is evidence for Agrippa and for others to consider. Can you see the implication of what Paul is saying? He's laid down a challenge. Acts contains hundreds of statements about geography and governors and a whole host of other things as well. And these can be judged as true or false in light of the historical evidence that is completely independent of the New Testament record. So I want to examine this challenge under three headings. First, Acts contains reliable history. It avoids error. And the point, the point here is that it's, it's risky if you include generate, uh, details because later generations with their history and their, their archaeological discoveries can ask, did Luke really get it right? And the final challenge is, is any of this convincing? When you, when you look at the evidence, is it persuasive? So let's start the review, this review by, by staying with Paul standing front in front of King Agrippa. Is it, is it plausible that Paul could have been in front of King Agrippa uh, in Caesarea in the middle of the first century AD? Well, we can see if we go to Caesarea that Herod's palace was on the coast at, in that place and an amazing set of remains can be seen. It's a, it's a complex truly fit for a king. There's a pool and mosaics, and they've even located a hall which was in use at the time that Acts says Paul was imprisoned there. So maybe it's in this hall that Paul gave his defence. So this is a good example of what we find in Acts. Events fit into what we know of the history and the geography. The timing is correct. Agrippa had just recently had his kingdom extensive, uh, extended, and so a visit to Caesarea at this point of his reign is timely 
and natural. Now at this point someone might push back and say not so fast. Think about the Spider-Man comics. They're set in New York. They mention the Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty. So 2,000 years from now, so the arguments go, archaeologists could dig up the remains of the Empire State Building. Does that prove that Spider-Man exists? Of course not. And the sceptic might say that the historical details about Caesarea may be accurate. The timing of events happening there may be plausible. But that doesn't mean that the events happened as described. So to answer that, we have to say that the author of Acts doesn't get some facts right as we go through his text and compare it to archaeology and other historians, we discover he gets dozens correct. And it's the cumulative impact of this accurate historical detail that gives Acts the Acts account its credibility. And we can see that Luke's care with detail shows that he is informed and can be relied upon. The writer of this book, Colin Hema, identifies 84 confirmable facts in, in chapters 13 through 28. That's a huge number in, that, in those chapters. And you can see on the screen the kinds of ca categories that these facts fall into. The great variety, the characteristics of cities, political boundaries, even detailed meteorological evidence. And this is the key thing that we have to realise. The facts he discloses are hard-to-get right facts. He has no way of knowing. He doesn't have Google or Wikipedia. There aren't reference works he can consult. It would be extremely difficult to find these facts from other sources. Luke says he's an eyewitness for some of the narrative. Or we assume he also gets information from those who were eyewitnesses. If he was making this stuff up, it would really be difficult to get the, the information that he includes in his historical record. This is from Professor Bruce at Manchester University. He's an, an expert in the New Testament. And he writes, now all these evidences of accuracy are not accidental, a man whose accuracy can be demonstrated in matters where we are able to test it is likely to be accurate even where the means for testing him are not available. Accuracy is a habit of mind and we know from happy or unhappy experience that some people are habitually accurate just as others can be depended upon to be inaccurate. Luke's record entitles him to be regarded as a writer of habitual accuracy. So let's go back to Paul before Agrippa in Caesarea. Is there some detail that would be difficult to know? Is there a hard to know fact if it was writ being written by a forger years after the event? Well, Acts tells us, and, and this is the kind of detail that Luke doesn't need to include, Acts tells us that King Agrippa was with his sister Bernice. She was living with him at the time of Paul's trial, that we know. But just a few years before the trial, Bernice was married and living with her husband. And a few years later, she was married again and no longer living with her brother. So that short period of time that she was with her brother matches the time when Paul was a prisoner in Caesarea. Now you may say, well, that's micro detail. And the answer to that is absolutely. And it is those micro details that are tough to get correct. Let's work through a detailed example. Paul comes into contact with a number of high-ranking people on his journeys, and Luke goes out of his way not to be vague. He gives them names and titles, and that's high risk if you're making it up. So in Acts 13, Paul lands in Cyprus and he travels to Paphos. He meets the proconsul Sergius Paulus, who he converts to Christianity. It's a short account, but it raises quite a number of questions. Did an official 
named Sergius Paulus, exists during the first century AD? Did he rule over Cyprus? Was his title proconsul? Was the government of the island based at Paphos? A lot of questions. So, Paul, uh, Luke rather correctly called Sergius Paulus a proconsul. And the interesting thing is that not long before that, that would have been a mistake because the man in charge before that was called a prefect, not a proconsul. Paphos, we now know, was both the religious and civic centre and would be where the proconsul was based. And there are a number of inscriptions with the name Sergius Paulus. And one of them has the title proconsul. And these inscriptions can be dated to the middle of the first century. And one of the inscriptions is really tantalising. That's because it was found in Pisidian Antioch, which is where Paul travelled next. You can see on the map he goes to Perga, but he just leaves Perga and goes straight to Pisidian Antioch. It would be speculation, but did Sergius Paulus send Paul to preach to his family? Because he had family ties with Pisidian Antioch. We don't know. But this account has all the hallmarks of what Bruce called... Luke's habitual accuracy. Now to our second challenge. This is where there is a real risk of historical de- uh, historical error, rather, when a lot of detail is included. Now, a problem area for Luke as a historian is to assign the correct title to all the governors that Paul meets. They differed from province to province, sometimes from town to town. And there were, again, remember, he had no reference works. And there was another problem. The titles sometimes did not remain the same for any great length of time. We saw that in Cyprus. Administrative boundaries would change and then the titles would also change. This table shows the Greek transliteration of the titles Luke uses in different places. So it is a strategos in Philippi but a protos in Malta. And if he got it mixed up, if he got it the wrong way round and called the governor of Cyprus uh, a grammatius, a town clerk, or the man in charge in Ephesus, if he called him an antipartus or a proconsul, of course the critics would be quick to pounce, but he gets them correct. Now there was a problem with his term for the city authorities in Thessalonica. He called them polytarchs. But this word was nowhere to be found in Greek literature. So Luke was accused of historical inaccuracy. Until, of course, inscriptions were found in Thessalonica and the surrounding region with exactly that word. And no one now can dispute that Polytarchs ruled Thessalonica during the travels of Paul. The accusation of inaccuracy against Luke falls away. Now our final challenge category was does any of this detail make a difference? Can it really persuade people to take God's word seriously? Sir William Ramsey lectured in classical art and archaeology at Oxford University and he conducted an, uh, a series of archaeological research projects in Asia Minor, that's modern-day Turkey. Now, he consulted the Book of Acts, but he reckoned it was a second-century book without much historical value. But after extensive archaeological study, Ramsey found that the Book of Acts turned out to be reliable again and again. He first began to change his mind when he studied a geographical comment that the writer made describing a section of Paul's first missionary journey. It's a sort of, sort of detail that, that, that we would skip over. It's really very straightforward. In Acts 14, Luke writes that Paul fled from Iconium, Iconium rather, to the cities of Lystra and Derby, which were in Lycaonia. Now, Ramsey originally thought that this was an error because Everyone believed that Iconium was already part of Lycaonia at the time. So according to Ramsey, this would have been as bad as saying that someone fled from London to England. 
But he went on to discover that Iconium was not in the district of Lycaona, Lycaonia in the first century. Instead, it was outside of these geographical boundaries at that time. Now, this really got his, uh, his attention. And then, after 30 years of research, Ramsey ended up becoming convinced of Luke's reliability. He wrote, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, this author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. The record of the preaching journeys in Acts show that they did not take place in a secluded corner, but open to full public view. We can read the, the geographical details, the names and titles of the governors, and a host of other information, and can confidently conclude that we're reading reliable history. The events that are recorded in the book of Acts can withstand the light that is shone on them. And we can be sure that the Acts narrative has a sound basis of historical truth.